Hello. So we were talking about Discworld and the fact that I've always wanted to get into the series, but I never quite could, because I was going along with what fans had told me, which is that I shouldn't bother reading the first few books, because they don't represent the eventual quality and tone of the rest of the series. They wanted me to read the books in an order that sticks to one set of characters at a time, tracking their lives, and then going back to the beginning and reading about the next set of characters, and so on. Well, in a minute, I'm going to send you back to the video I've already made about the first five books in the series. But first of all, there's something I ought to mention, because it's been pointed out to me that this idea of reading the books in this order isn't just something that Discworld fans happen to have found themselves saying to me. It's actually a codified part of online Discworld fandom, and it looks like this. So the idea with this chart is that you pick a character, in this case the witches, and you follow the track reading their stories, and then you go back and you read another character's stories and so on. This is a wonderful resource. If you're interested in using it to read the Discworld stories yourself, then I'll put a link for it down in the description. Clearly a lot of work has been put into this. I'm no expert, of course, but I bet this is a really good order to read the books in. And you can just imagine the Usenet arguments that must have gone into compiling it. For me, though, it isn't going to help. I'm reading these books for the writer rather than for the lore or the continuity. I want to feel the way Pratchett develops his ideas and his style, the way the original readers would have done who made it the bestseller it is. If I followed this chart, I'd be able to see his style and his world develop, but then I'd be roughly dumped back to the beginning again when it came time to read about the next character's stories. Most artists of any kind develop their abilities as they go on, and if the fans are right and Pratchett is one of them, then it's going to be a very jarring tonal shift the first time I finish one track and have to go back to the beginning of another, and maybe I'd find it tricky to carry on reading. But because I'm reading the books in publication order, I don't have that in-depth knowledge of the way the series is supposed to be, the way it's going to be. So nothing feels jarring to me about those early books, in fact I find them really enjoyable. But if you've already read the books and you want to go back and read the series again, I bet that chart is a great way of doing it. So again, if you're interested, the link's down there. So back to the book corner with you then, where I'll tell you about how a Discworld noob like me reacts to reading the first five books for the first time. Here we are, you can see them now. Book one! The Colour of Magic and the Light Fantastic. This is one book. It looks like two, I know, but it's not. One book. That's how long it is. Read it. I found myself completely comfortable and at home reading this, which came as a pleasant surprise after all the negative press that I'd heard from fans saying that, you know, the style isn't refined yet, and so on. Well, no it isn't, but it's introduced here. This is Pratchett coming into it himself. Without this great breadth of knowledge and familiarity with the way the series is supposed to be, I was able to take it completely as it presented itself. And of course this is a book that he's been making them for decades because of the success of this book. And it deserves it. It's a good read. It's fun. And it's not much more than that. This isn't uh, a great literary work. It's fun. That's what it is. And all of the ideas in it are good. They all are. And most of them are throwaway little jokes. Some of them are throwaway little jokes that nevertheless, you know, remain for the whole of the rest of the series, like death. Discworld is famous for having death as one of its main characters, you know, the Grim Reaper. He is in this book as a throwaway gag because, you know, the main character, Rincewind, is quite obviously about to die constantly all the time. And that's the extent of the joke. You know, death will show up and then Rincewind will survive and death will be like, oh, oh you. And of course people say it's not really death because his character is fleshed out, so to speak, in later books. And that's absolutely right, which is why it was important that I read this one first. And in fact, the biggest moment in that comes in book three, Equal Rights, uh, with the introduction of Granny Weatherwax. Uh, but anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. Because, by the way, oh, I didn't tell you what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm reading them all. I haven't just read the first book, I haven't just read the second book. I haven't read all of the books, but I'm five books in, and I'm going to keep updating you uh, as I go on. These two books are about... And how about here we just skip over the part of the video where I dutifully run through all the information that anyone with even the remotest passing interest in Discworld already knows. Rincewind, wizard, terrible at it, wizards, university. The luggage, trunk, millions of little legs, two flower, Taurus, poverty, tourism, grimy and horrible city of Ankh-Morpork. For more clarity on any of this, see any other occasion in which anyone has said anything about Discworld. There's no point in me trying to sort of tell you what the story is because there kind of isn't one. And this is why so many people told me not to really bother with this book, because, you know, n not much happens in it, it's just a sort of wrong version of Discworld. But no, it really introduces you to the sort of thing you're in for, and it's it's the way in. It's the writer's way in, and it's the reader's way in, for me anyway. And then you get to book two, which, and it literally it starts the moment book one finishes, which ends on a cliffhanger. Literally! This book starts, resolves the cliffhanger, and suddenly you're in a story, and it has a conclusion, and a climax, and everything. So book one, and book two, you're generally just sort of exploring Discworld and seeing what's there, and of course this is Pratchett's way of being able to parody all of the different little ideas and tropes that you find in bog-standard fantasy stories. And before long, you know, you get book two, and all of the concepts and places and characters, the types of wizard he's writing about, form into a story by the end of book two. And you have this big finish, and you have this conclusion, and it ends on an absolutely wonderful note. So we've been introduced to the world, then you get book three, which is 
equal rights. Now, I'm just going to take a little detour here, because you may be aware that over the last few years, Pratchett has been writing a series of children's books um, called the Tiffany Aching series. Well, is it called that? I don't know, but it's a series about Tiffany Aching anyway. Including We Free Men, Hatful of Sky, Wintersmith, I Shall Wear Midnight, and I think that's it. Well, what these books are about, if you didn't know, is a girl who is training to become a witch. And she is trained by Granny Weatherwax, a character very familiar to Discworld fans, because She's one of the main ones. And this series serves, uh, well, firstly, as just a wonderful series of books for children, but also, secondly, as a kind of treatise on what Pratchett means when he says witches. See, he has this whole brilliant idea as to what a witch is and to what witch's work is. An old woman who everyone in the village knows and who helps everybody, but with duties, you know, partly nurse, uh, partly just sort of local figurehead. Anyway, don't listen to me. Read the Tiffany Aching books. And in fact, if you if you aren't sure where to start... <laughs> see, I'm doing it now. I should have mentioned this earlier, I forgot to. I read these before I started this little Discworld reading project. They don't call themselves Discworld books. They take place on the Discworld, but they don't go on about it. And it, it, essentially, these are the product of a, a Pratchett who has written his world for so long that it really has become a world, and he doesn't need to keep making jokes about elephants and turtles. So these are ostensibly a separate standalone series, but they do happen to tie in with Discworld because Granny Weatherwax is in it, and she acts as this kind of grand high witch for us all to look up to and think of as the ideal of what is meant by witch. And the reason I bring it up here is because the first Tiffany Aching book is sort of a remake of Equal Rights. Sort of. I kind of get the sense that the Tiffany Aching books are an attempt to take this book and recraft it into something that fits Discworld now. Because here we have a story of a young girl who's training to be magic. She is destined to be a wizard. She's just destined to be. It's an accident, but she is. But no one will let her be because she's a girl and girls are witches and wizards are a totally different thing. And over the course of the book, this is where Pratchett first brings in his ideas of what a witch is, and how, you know, a witch is this sort of actually useful figure in the community, even if she might not, you know, let off many spells all the time. And uh, meanwhile, wizards are just these sort of annoying, bumbling academics. Uh, he, he'd already established those, but he really brings it into focus how just not useful they are. <laughs> I enjoyed that it introduced something which I already knew about Pratchett, but which was not quite evident in the first two Discworld books, which, as I say, were kind of a series of sketches, really. And that is that it gives you a great idea of the kind of story that Terry Pratchett is going to write each time. Remember when you were little and story meant something different to what it means now? If someone said story then, you would think, oh, well, it's gonna have magic in it, and it's going to have... And then you would suddenly, you know, if you were anything like me anyway, your your mind would be bubbling away with ideas of the sort of thing that's in stories, like wizards and fairies and magic and adventures and, you know... And, and if you were going to write a story, whatever you wanted at that moment, your story could go there. If you wanted to be on a pirate ship, great, we'll be on a pirate ship. If you wanted to be in space, we'll be in space. Then you get older and you start to change and reevaluate what you think a story is. Now you're a grown-up, so now stories have to be about human drama and politics and, you know, the, the social constructs that we build and which ones help us and which ones hinder us. And all of these kind of human, grown-up, dramatic ideas become our idea of what a story is and should be. So even in you know fantasy writing, people will take those ideas and they'll put them into fantasy worlds. So like now, if you say right now to someone fantasy, first thing they think of is Game of Thrones, because that's the big popular fantasy thing right now. And there you go, that's sort of politics and personal dramas put into a, a fantasy setting. He says, knowing full well he's never read or watched Game of Thrones, come on Dave, let's not pretend we know what we're talking about any more than we do. But you know what I'm getting at, right? Game of Thrones it's, as far as I can tell, it is in a fantasy setting, but it's less magic wands and strokes of midnight fairy tale stuff, and it's more medieval warfare stuff. And that's what I was getting at. It's human affairs, but put into an armour and dragon setting. Okay, so, as I was saying before I was so rudely intercut. But what Terry Pratchett does, which I really like and I'm really grateful for, is he writes the first kind of story. He goes, no, let's have wizards, and let's have magic. And that's just really refreshing. You know, he writes stories the way... I thought about stories when I was little. Um, 
but for me to enjoy now. And so you do find yourself at the end of, of a book surrounded by sort of magic explosions and so on. Anyway, Equal Rights is one of those books, but also the character of Granny Weatherwax is so underdeveloped in this that I can see why people would want you to just skip it. I've already mentioned what Granny Weatherwax as a character ends up being. In this first book, she's essentially just a cartoon witch. And so when she comes in, you know, he's quick to point out that she has a warty nose and chin and things like this. But then as the story goes on, he starts to introduce some of the ideas that he will later develop into his whole concept of what witching is. And by that time, Granny Weatherwax becomes a completely different person and has left that cartoon witch behind. You start off by assuming, oh, here's a witch, and it becomes a sort of a clever twist on what a witch is. The only bit that I did think was really weird and hard to adjust to was the fact that because of the Tiffany Aching books I know about Granny Weatherwax, and what I know that Granny Weatherwax wouldn't do is have a sword in the stone magician's duel. And she does, in this book. So she's turning into different things, trying to defeat, you know, a wizard who's turning into different things, and they're having a fight. And it's a, it is a strange moment that definitely doesn't gel with what I know she becomes. But that's why I perhaps shouldn't have read ahead and should have, you know, started at the beginning and worked my way through and let it develop, because Obviously it worked the first time around, it's only when you read them in the wrong order that this, this comes up as a problem. So that one was alright. I would have probably enjoyed it a lot more uh, if it weren't for the fact that I'd already read a kind of a better version of it. And then we have Mort. Now then, I don't know this for sure, but I would guess that this is the book that a lot of fans say is the start of the real Discworld books. Firstly, because it's the first book that's really about death, the character. And no fan of Reaper Man, which every fan of Discworld is, can be comfortable leaving this out of their roster of Discworld books. It also expands on the character of his adopted daughter. She does pop up in one of the first two books, couldn't tell you which one, they, they run together as I say, and they blended into one in my mind. But they end up at Death's house at one point, and she's there, and there's obviously a joke going on, but I don't know what it is. So the story of this one, if you're interested, if you don't already know, there is a boy looking for an apprenticeship, and then Death shows up on his horse looking for an apprentice. Pratchett really expands on the character of Death in this book, and he really establishes that he's got a lot to say about any given character he ever wants to talk about. He expands on the whole concept of what it is to be Death, what it's like to do that job, and one of the things is that you have to be distant from it, and you have to do it as work, as opposed to being, you know, he's not any kind of avenging spirit, he's just, he's got a job to do. Meanwhile, Mort feels as if perhaps that job might be a bit harsh. He isn't the embodiment of death, so he puts a bit of a human twist on the job, and of course, therefore, fails entirely to do it, and things go wrong, and all of time and space has to be fixed. And we're back to my childhood idea of what a story was. Here we are in a very exciting adventure, and the world is changing, and magic is happening, and it's all, it's all there. This is a good book. I don't need to tell you any more about it than that. You'll, you'll like it. But I imagine most of you watching this probably have read these books and are mainly watching just to sort of see how someone like me who hasn't read them yet uh, but is invested in them anyway, weirdly, uh, responds to reading them in order, and that's kind of what I'm here to give you. So next, we have Sorcery, which I just finished reading the other day. Now, remember? This was the one, wasn't it, when I was 15, that I really, really, really connected to. Um, not so much this time. I certainly didn't not enjoy it, but it wasn't the... I mean, let me tell you, I, I mean, it changed a lot about me when I read it the first time around. I had a great time reading it. And um, I think I was, because I was 15, I was in danger of entering that period in your life where you think that everything should be deadly serious and that, you know, stories should be deep. And st especially stories about magic ought to be deep and sinister. This just disavowed me of that immediately. Um, now, I had a, a, a fantastic time reading this when I was a kid. Um, I had a good time reading it as an adult. It's fine. Um, it's probably not as good as Mort. Um, and it, there is something comforting and familiar about returning to Unseen University and Rincewind and the luggage and things like that. It, it re really is a fond and familiar place to be. After this, I have no idea what happens with any of those in the series ever again. I don't know. They might. None of them might come back as far as I know, so I'm looking forward to finding out. This story tears them down. It takes the, uh, the Unseen University, it takes the wizards, it takes the establishment, and it rips it to pieces because the story here is that a baby is born and he's a sorcerer and that's source Error. See? So he's a source of magic. He can just pull reality apart and do whatever he wants. And what he wants, because he's sort of under the control of a sinister evil wizard, is to rebuild the hierarchy of things with sorcerers at the top. 
ultimately even above the gods. And the resulting story is as sort of magically explosive as it sounds. And that was what I really loved about it, was the fact that, you know, here I am reading a book where, you know, the whole world can just change from one page to the next and really amazing things can happen. It's fun, and I enjoyed it, and that's about all I have to say about it. It didn't, as I say, grip me quite as much as it did when I was a kid. You know when you're, you know when you're reading a book and you sort of trail off and you end up reading something else? instead in the middle, and maybe you'll return to the book, maybe not. Well, in the middle of this book, I trailed off long enough to read Dune. So, you know, uh, take that whichever way you will. But I came back to it, picked it up again really easily, I didn't feel, you know, lost. And it's good fun again, like the first couple of books, and it's nice to return to these places. And, and it doesn't just feel as if he was mandated to write about Rincewind again. And so there we are! I am now reading Discworld. I am in it, I get it, I'm, I'm finally comfortable, it feels good, I'm liking it, and I'm going to continue all the way to the end. And then I'll be sad, because Terry Pratchett is very ill, and by the time I get to the end of the books, he's not going to be writing books. And that's... that's going to be weird. So, I'm going to keep you updated uh, as I read more of them, I'll come back and talk to you about them. Um, there's something really pleasant that I'm finding in these books that I wasn't aware was there, which is that... How shall I describe this? I've always felt, now and then, I go through little periods of just honestly wanting wizards. <laughs> and I think this comes from games. I think I'm thinking back to when I was a kid playing on the ZX Spectrum, and now and then there'd be a game with a wizard in it. And of course, in those days, it would be just a generic wizard with a pointy hat and a beard. And there'd be no twist to it, you know, he wouldn't be any kind of modern take on wizards, he would just be a wizard. So that's always been in my head as a thing that I like. And it's nowhere, you can't get it, you can't find it, because all fantasy has to be a gritty new take on fantasy. And you know what? This is where it is. I'm finding it in these Discworld books, and I'm not finding it anywhere else, and it's absolutely possible that that thing that's been at the back of my mind all these years has been that I want to read Discworld. It could have been sorcery that seeded this in the first place. And it's it's just funny to me that a series that purports to be a deconstruction of fantasy and a parody of it is actually, at the same time, one of the most sincere, <laughs> you know, actual examples of a, a fantasy series set in a fantasy world. In these Discworld books, I've found something that I know is always going to be a comfortable read, and that sounds like a criticism, but it isn't. Sometimes you just want to enjoy yourself, and these Discworld books are how to do that. It's funny, but that's not what I'm there for. You know, there are jokes in it, and you go, ha ha, at them, but you don't go like, ha 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 ha, you just, you know, you just acknowledge them and move on. No, it's the part of it that I like. It's the actual world and the actual characters. In fact, in the first few books, the, the humour of it is uh, more of a focus than, than I remember it ever being later. And in fact, it seems to take cues from Douglas Adams, and I seem to remember making a note that page 100 131 of Sorcery contains an example of that. Yes, here we go. Listen to how hitchhikery this is. Why the gods allow this sort of thing to continue is a mystery. Actually, the flash of inspiration needed to explain it clearly and precisely has taken place, but the creature who received it, a small female blue tit, has never been able to make the position clear, even after some really strenuous coded messages on the tops of milk bottles. By a strange coincidence, a philosopher... You can hear this being read out by Peter Jones, can't you? By a strange coincidence, a philosopher who had been devoting some sleepless nights to the same mystery woke up that morning with a wonderful new idea for getting peanuts out of bird tables. Right, well, and I've talked about this for far too long, so perhaps I won't do them in five book chunks from now on, but uh, I'll come back anyway and report back to you again when I've read some more of those, and um, you can see what I thought of them. Um, in the meantime, I guess we'll talk about some other stuff. I can talk about some other books I've been reading as well. Uh, I've read Dune.